Thank you for joining us today for the introduction to Embroidery University, proudly brought to you by myself, Julie Hall from Julie Hall Designs. Um, I am passionate about embroidery. I purchased my first machine in 2001 and since then um, I have used it not only to create a business for myself, but it is one of the most fun hobbies that I have ever indulged in. Um, I made lots and lots of mistakes that I will be sharing with you throughout this course in the hope that you possibly won't make the same mistakes. I began digitising when I was at home with my first child in 2005, a long time ago now, and then I started my business when I soon after discovered that I was expecting um, twins and I would be at home with three babies for an awfully long time. This course is all about you and helping you get the most out of your embroidery machine. All lessons will be available for download and will include notes pages as well as videos and projects which include designs. Um, I do encourage you to do the projects along with us in the hope that you'll learn new techniques and better ways of doing things as we go along. The lessons will start with the basics such as hooping, thread selection, fabric selection and then move on to more specialty techniques such as bullion work and stump work. You'll also get tips for perfecting your embroidery and the chance to share your own experiences and projects with other embroiderers. So let's get started with starting your embroidery and the correct tools for such. So the first tool that we need to look at is your embroidery machine. Now many of you will have your machines. If so, you can probably fast forward a little bit. Um, for those of you who are currently looking at what machine to purchase, this could be an interesting module for you. These days embroidery machines come in many different styles with many different features. Um, when I got started back in 2001, um, the main thing that we were looking at was hoop size, which is certainly still a consideration, but the hoop size in those days was this size hoop, and that was a massive hoop. Um, the key areas that I believe you need to examine as you purchase an embroidery machine is first of all, are you looking for an embroidery machine or an um, embroidery and sewing machine? Both have their pluses and minuses. If I was starting out these days, I may end up just looking at an embroidery only machine, keeping my sewing machine so that then I could be doing two things at once. Um, having said that, the embroidery only machines generally don't come with the, side, with the massive hoops that the other machines do. Um, so you may sacrifice a little on that. I tell people to take a look at brand. The reason I recommend that people take a look at brand um, is, first of all, are you brand loyal? If you've always used brand X of machines, you're going to be more comfortable with that. Second reason I look at it is what do your friends have? Many people purchase embroidery machines because their friends have got them and they see how much fun their friends are having. If that's the case, buying a similar or buying something from the same family as your friends could be a positive because you've got somebody there to help you. The third thing that I look at is the hoop size. These days you can go everything from a four centimeter hoop right up to a 14 inch hoop. They are getting larger and larger. Um, as much as I say bigger isn't always better, bigger hoops give you more abilities when you're joining designs together and when you are doing massive designs, which is something to be aware of. Um, the minimum size that I would suggest anybody look at is a 5 by 7 hoop. Now, when I say a 5 by 7 hoop, this hoop 
is actually quite larger than that. Um, this is about nine inches tall and about six, six and a half inches wide. But the embroidery area within that hoop is not that. If you have a look at a machine that you're looking at purchasing, you want to ask what the embroidery field size is. And for instance, on this hoop, you can actually see that you take off the bottom and the top inch and the side maybe three quarters of an inch and then you've got your embroidery field. Do you want a single needle machine or do you want a multi-needle machine? These days there are more and more machines coming out on the market suiting those of us who want to turn our hobby um, or our crafting passion into a business. Um, each of these machines come with their pluses and minuses as well and you can go from anything from a four thread machine, meaning that you can have four threads loaded at one time, um, right up to 1820 um, thread or head machine. It is totally up to you. I have in my um, range of machines a multi-needle machine and I absolutely adore it. It is so lovely to be able to load a design and have it stitch out without me having to change the threads. Um, but the multi-needle machines are embroidery only, so that is something to be aware of as well. And last but certainly not least comes the consideration of budget. Um, when you are looking at your machine, look at it not only that you need to purchase a machine, but it's the ancillary things that you're going to need to purchase on top of that. So when I'm talking ancillary things, I'm talking about our consumables. Um, and the reason I like to mention this is because nobody told me this when I purchased my first machine. I knew I'd have to buy thread. Um, you know, I wasn't silly. Um, but there was so much other stuff that I really hadn't considered. So the first thing that you're going to have to purchase is stabiliser. I laugh going back now. Nobody told me that I needed stabiliser and the first design that I ever attempted to stitch out on my first machine, um, I loaded up a Bonds, one of those really stretchy little kid shirts. Popped it in the machine, no stabiliser, no nothing, set it to go and I watched the machine eat that t-shirt. Um, and then I learned about stabiliser and what I should have been doing. So, live and learn. Stabiliser comes in many, many forms um, and we'll be going through each of these one by one um, and looking at the benefits of each as we go along. You are going to need threads. Once again, threads come in many different forms. Um, I like polyester thread. I like it because it is stronger, I like it because it is hard wearing and I like it because these days it has a great sheen to it, much different than what it used to do. Um, when you are looking at your threads, I recommend that people buy the best quality that they can afford at the time. Um, I have had every different type of thread from great quality to really, really bad quality. Um, Generally speaking, your threads will be over-dyed. So you're rarely going to have a problem with a nice light colour of thread because this thread has been dyed once. However, when you get to your darker colour threads, if something goes wrong with a light colour thread, they might dye it a darker colour so that they don't have to throw it away. So as a general rule, you will always have more trouble with dark colour threads than with light colour threads. Um, to this rule, I never scrimp on my black, red and dark brown. These appear to be the colours that I have the most trouble with when I buy cheap threads. You are going to need needles. And we're going to discuss different needle size and different specialty needles and all the different things that you can do with needles along the way as well. You are going to need bobbin fill. 
Bob and fill comes in a couple of different ways. You can have pre-wound bobbins, which are my preference, um, because it means that I don't have to wind them myself. Or you can get um, a large spool of bobbin fill and wind your own bobbin. And we'll talk about bobbin fill as we go along. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, <coughs> excuse me, bobbin fill is the I'm trying to work out the best words, is a very thin thread um, that you use on the back of your design um, that um, keeps Obviously, it's, so it's, a, it's a thread that keeps the design together, but because it is so fine, it really does stop the um, design from being too clunky as you go around. And lastly, you'll need embroidery designs, and you'll need a way to get those embroidery designs onto your sewing machine. Different machines these days have Wi-Fi capabilities or cloud capabilities, or there are so many different ways of doing things. I'm a little bit of an old-fashioned gal. I like my USB. I load the design that I'm using on it and then, um, then use them on the machine. So there are consumable products that you're going to use a lot. We then have ancillary products that make your embroidery life just that little bit easier. And these are our stitch in the jig range. Whilst these stitch in the jigs are not mandatory, you'll have a much better experience by using them. So the first one that I love is my squeeze scissors. These are the ones that I really could not do without. So my squeeze scissors are curved tipped and they are really fine and they just give a little squeeze motion. What that means is when I've got something in a hoop, I can just slide my scissors in and trim any excess threads away. We have these two helper mats which we will be discussing with our first class. A stabiliser cutter to cut your stabiliser um, and avoid using your scissors to cut your stabiliser because your stabiliser is a paper product. Um, we also have the screw it up which we will discuss a little later on for managing your, um, to tighten and loosen your hoops. And our precision oiler for cleaning and oiling your machine. Once you've got your machine, some things to think about. The first thing is storage of your tools. Make sure that your machine is when it is not in use. Um, I totally get wanting to have it out on display and see it and being able to touch it. Um, totally get it. Having said that, um, the less dust you can let into the machine, the better. Even just between uses, putting a cover over it is a worthwhile thing and we will be creating a cover later on in our course. Until then, you can easily use your, the cover that came with the machine, or at worst case, a sheet. Keeping the dust out will be well worth it. Keep your threads in a cool, dark place. Um, away from damp, sunlight, and for heaven's sakes, please keep them away from smoke. There is nothing that will ruin a thread um, quicker than cigarette smoke. Store your stabilizers according to their type. So my tear cleans I keep in a roll on my workbench. My washaways or meltaways I keep in plastic Ziploc bags. Uh, I have seen people run through the rain with their washaway stabilizers and then wonder why it looks like it's been an acid rainfall. It's because the rain has begun to disintegrate it. Keep scissors stored so that the blades are not pressing against anything. So I like a magnetic rack and I have one in my office to store my scissors straight up. The last thing that you want is the scissors going into anything that can blunt the tip. Um, hang your hoops up to avoid them getting broken. And once again, pegs are, peg hooks are brilliant for that. 
Um, and one of the best suggestions that I've ever had is to keep all of your tools together in one tray or box or bag so that you know where everything is. I, for instance, have a travelling kit that I store all of my excess tools, that I store all of my daily tools in. Um, as I said before, ensure that your USBs only store the designs that you are currently using on them. One of the biggest mistakes that I see people make with um, data storage is to not back everything up to their computer. Um, the USB are not infallible by any way, shape or design. Um, the fact that they are going in and out of multiple machines sometimes does not help. Um, so your main storage is always going to be your computer or your device with the USB and taking it to the machine being the secondary storage only. Okay, so that's what we're looking at in getting started with machine embroidery. I hope you've enjoyed this and you've got one or two, one or two tricks out of it. What I'm going to move on to next is stabilizers and hooping and we are going to do a fantastic um, project of creating our Christmas tea towels. I hope you can join us then. Until next time, I'm Julie Hall. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Julie Hall and today we are going to look at stabilizers and hooping. To me this is the spine, the backbone, however you want to call it, the most important part of all of your stitching. If you do your hooping correctly, everything else is going to be so much easier. First thing that we're going to look at is stabilizer. And the stabilizer that we're going to focus on today is the Terra Clean range. So, first of all, we are going to look at what does stabilizer do. And stabilizer acts as your support system to um, the fabric. Stabilizer acts as a support system to our fabric. When you embroider on the fabric, you are altering the fabric. If you are embroidering a crossway, say in a direction, which many um, designs have multiple um, directions in them to help add extra texture and interest to the design, you can easily pull along the bias and drag that design off centre. Stabiliser will assist you in stopping that. Um, Terra-based stabilizers generally have no warp or weft and therefore they don't have the ability to move. Depending on the number of stitches in your design and dense designs are different than more open weave designs, you may need more than one piece of stabilizer. So stabilizer is there to act and to hold a certain number of stitches as a general rule. Stabilizer comes in a couple of different styles. You have tearaway stabilizers or our tear clean range. We have the cutaway or poly mesh range. And then we also have wash away and melt away. And each month we'll be looking at a different range of stabilizers there. Within each style of stabilizer, there are many different brands and weights, and they all have their good and bad. Um, properties. I'm sharing with you my stabilizers and I began stocking stabilizers only about a year ago because so many people want to know which ones I use and which ones I trust. These are the ones that I've been using for the last 15 years and that work best for me. First thing that I absolutely adore is my stabilizer wrap bands just because they hold the stabilizer on. So this is my tearaway stabiliser. To cut my stabiliser, I come through and I want to cut approximately an inch more than the hoop size. 
So I could be I could be chintzy and cut along this way, but that's not going to support my fabric because I'm about a centimetre out. I would prefer to use up a little bit more stabiliser and have a better result at the end. So I'm going to come through and that's why I love my stabiliser cutter because it clearly cuts my stabiliser very easily and it doesn't ruin my scissors because stabiliser is a paper product. Now, one of the reasons I love my stabiliser, I'm just going to roll it the opposite way to get a nice straight look to it, is because of how it tears. What I'm looking for in a stabiliser is something that is going to, certainly in a tear away stabiliser, is something that is going to tear away cleanly. Um, I want it there for support, but then I want it gone when I want it gone. And that's one of the reasons I love mine. So, Tear Clean is a beautiful medium weight stabiliser that's not too hard to the touch and comes away easily from your project. We also have Iron-On Tear Clean. This is a piece of 100% cotton fabric that has my Tear Clean ironed on the back. You use an iron-on for a couple of reasons. First reason I use iron-on is when I'm doing a really large project with multiple hoopings. If I place my tear clean on the back, what it means is that I can hoop once there and once there and once there without worrying about where my stabiliser is because I already know that it's on the back of the project. The other reason I like using iron-on is because it means that then I don't have to worry about holding two items, I only have to worry about holding one. The reason I love my Tear Clean iron is because it comes away easily. Once you're finished with your embroidery, you just remove the excess and any little bits that are floating around still will just come out in the first wash of your project. But the main one that we're going to focus on today is the basic tear clean. So what to look for in a tear away? Easy tear away. You want there to be no warp or weft. So you'll see this stabiliser does not have that movable grain line to it. And that is exactly what you are after. Um, now, a couple of stabiliser hacks. Your basic stabiliser, so one sheet on a piece of 100% cotton fabric, will hold between 35,000 and 40,000 stitches. If your design has more stitches than that, use a second. Multiple pieces of stabiliser at the back of your project. I've seen many people who stock in their kits a medium weight, a light weight, and a heavy weight tear away stabiliser. Personally, I only have one stabiliser in my kit and I will just use multiple pieces of that stabiliser. Um, the other hack that I like to tell people is when you're doing a really dense design and you need to have that design line up around the edge, Adding a second piece of stabiliser is not only a great thing to do, but there is a way to do it so that, I've got my finger caught in there now, for those really dense designs, I've got my stabiliser on the bottom, I've got my fabric on the top, and then I'm going to come through And I'm going to place another piece of stabiliser on the top. When I then hoop, I'll hoop all three layers together. And hooping is what we're going to look at next. And that design will then be stitched out onto those three layers. And you will get absolutely no movement whatsoever. Now, 
The last question that I want to answer with stabiliser is the one that I get asked a lot and everybody has an opinion on it. To hoop or not to hoop? So many people tell me that they hoop their fabric and then they float their stabiliser underneath. Um, I object to that on many, many levels. Um, the first level is that it's just not stable. Um, your stabiliser, and to me, it's the question, the answer is always hoop. So it is called stabiliser, and it is there to stabilise the fabric in the hoop. To do that, it needs to be in the hoop. Um, and yeah, there is no question on that whatsoever for me. Um, there are instances, as we, and we'll go through different ones as we go through different projects, for instance, when you do towels, where instead of hooping your fabric, you'll hoop your stabiliser. Um, and there will be times when you've got your item and your stabiliser together in the hoop. And you can see I'm not sure what I'm doing here because I don't have everything lined up. And because it's a dense design, you'll then float another piece under. That's absolutely fine. But at least one piece of stabiliser must be hooped with your fabric to give a perfect and great result. I hope you've enjoyed that talk on stabilisers. The next thing we're going to look at is hooping and then our project. Thank you for joining me. The last part, getting started with embroidery, is our hooping. First question we get asked is, is hooping really that important? And the answer is, heavens, yes it is. To me it's the most important part of machine embroidery. If your embroidery is not well hooped, your project is not going to look well done. Um, it may be out of alignment, it could be warped, or the hoop could even pop out of the area. So the tools for hooping. The first tool is our hoop helper mat. This mat is made of a soft rubber. It's not sticky, but it does hold the hoop in position. So if I place the bottom of my hoop onto the hoop helper mat, the hoop is then unable to move around within um, the area, making it so much easier to get my fabric, stabiliser and top of the hoop together and centred and in place. You are of course going to need your hoop. You want to use the smallest hoop that your design will fit into. There is no use in doing a design that is that large in a hoop that is that large. There is all that extra fabric there that can easily come out of distortion and you'll be using extra stabiliser, etc. as well. We've got our screw it up that goes onto the hoop and helps us tighten that screw. That's just a nice to have. I've broken many fingers over the years and arthritis is starting to set in and it just makes it easier for me. You're going to need the template of your design. The template is what we use to line up with our hoop markings. And last of all, you're going to need fabric and stabiliser. Suit your fabric to the design. So, for instance, I am creating tea towels here. These are 100% cotton, lovely quality tea towels. They have... Um, no stretch in them which makes them very easy to stitch out on 
and that is what we are going to work with in our project today. Okay. So, let's come into our steps for hooping. The first step is preparation. By preparation, I mean, let's get our hoop mat and put it on a nice flat surface. Let's print out our template. Let's cut a piece of stabiliser that is approximately one inch larger than our hoop. And then we want to take the hoop and unscrew it so that the hoop, is, the hoop top is going to slide easily in and out from when we're setting up the design. You don't want to unhoop it to the point that it's going to fall apart. Just make it, just give it that little bit of give. Step two is to choose where your design will go. Now, when I'm choosing where my design will go, what I've already done is I've already prepared my fabric, and I've prepared my fabric by you by ironing it and using a spray starch. I'm then going to come along and take my template and choose where I would like that design to go. This is a um, friction removable marking pen. I don't recommend these for long term use. The reason is that I've had a couple of instances lately where the marks have come back or not been removed. But for this example, it's a great way to show. Personally these days, I prefer using pencil marks. So all I'm going to do is mark up these markings showing the quarter points of my design. And then with a ruler, expand those out. And that's what we use our template for. Now, I save my templates because you never know when you're going to use them again. Okay, I can put my ruler aside now. Next thing that I want to do is start getting everything together. So, my hoop goes on the bottom and being compulsive as I am, I line up my inside hoop markings with the lines on my hoop map. I'm then going to get, and I'm going to move that to the side a little bit so I can work in the same area and everybody can see, my fabric and lay it on top of my stabiliser. I'm then going to take my hoop and I'm making sure that my alignment marks, so the top of my hoop is going to be at the top of my hoop, and I've got crosshatch alignment marks right here and right here. I'm lining those marks up with the lines that I have drawn. Making sure that your stabiliser is totally under the hooped area and that's why you leave that one inch of extra wiggle room. I pick up both layers, move over to my hoop And whilst I'm holding both layers there, ease the hoop in. Now, movement will happen. And you can see here, it's happened right here. So this line is now totally out of alignment. That's where the alignment line is. That's where the actual line is. So that's where you start. Pop it back out of the hoop. realign and never be afraid of going back. What you want to be able to do is get it into the hoop in that straight line and it might take a couple of hoopings. 
without pulling on the fabric. By pulling on the fabric, what I mean is so many people put their fabric in and then they will start pulling the fabric here or here just to fix up those alignments. Don't do that because what that does is it puts the design or it puts the fabric out of the warp and weft and that's where you're going to end up with puffer fabric. Once that's done, we're going to use our screw hoop to tighten the screw up. And I'm sorry I realise I'm doing that the wrong way around for the camera. If you are concerned that possibly it's not tight enough, once the hoop's tightened, you can come through, pop one side out, and then back in, and that will tighten it up fully. You are now ready to embroider your design. Thank you very much. I hope you'll join me in creating this beautiful tea towel Christmas project. Enjoy.